evening and welcome to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates, a platform to deliberate the challenges this region will face in the 21st century. I'm Brendan Fernandez and I will be your moderator. Tonight's motion is, ageism is a necessary evil for progress in Asia. Asia's growth in recent decades has been nothing short of meteoric. But the region has had to rely heavily on a young workforce to power its economy. As age catches up and this pool of young workers dries up, who can governments turn to to fuel their growth engines? Can Asian economies continue to thrive as birth rates decline and life expectancy increases? Should they skew their policies towards the young in order to buy their commitment? Our distinguished panel of speakers will deliberate this motion. In our audience today, we have stakeholders, academics, thinkers and business people. Earlier, we polled our audience to find out what their stand on this issue is. Currently, 28.6% agree with the motion and 71.4% disagree. We'll be doing another poll later to see if the audience opinion has shifted. Let's now welcome our panelists. Let's start off with the team proposing today's motion. First, Dr. Omkar Shreshta, visiting senior fellow, research fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. He's also the deputy country director of the Economics and Programming Unit of the Vietnam Resident Mission at the Asian Development Bank. Welcome. Joining him is Professor Srikant Gupta from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And now over to the opposition. First, Dr. Mukul Asher, a development economist with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And joining him is Ms. Thelma Kay, Director of the Emerging Social Issues Division at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your panel for the motion, Ageism is a Necessary Evil for Progress in Asia. Each panelist will now be given one minute to state their case. Based on our coin toss earlier, the proposition will begin. So, Dr. Omkar, if you're ready, your one minute begins now. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what is ageism? To me, ageism means well-considered, deliberate, and differentiated treatment to various age groups uh, in line with, according to your, uh, uh, your, your affording capability and the resource positions, be it a family, a nation, or in this case, Asia. Now, studies indicate Asia can be, the, the 21st century can be Asian century, but to that happen, our young people, this is a young Asia, they need to be strengthened, they need to be trained, they need to be uh, the, the technology, R&D, innovations is going to be their future. And the only way to strengthen, to make Asia progressive is to count on and train, make, the, make, make our young people ready and for the future. That's going to be very complex. Therefore, our limited resources should be devoted for Asia to the young people. It is, Asia's progress will depend on young people's population, uh, young, young people's training. And Thank you, Dr. Omkar. Your <clears throat> time is up. Now over to the opposition, Dr. Asher. Your one minute starts now. Thank you. There are several arguments that support the opposition to this motion. First, demographic factors are significant, but not of overwhelming importance in explaining Asia's growth. Key factor increasingly will be ability to generate adapt and diffuse knowledge and new ways of combining existing resources to improve efficient use of resources. This will require all age groups to cooperate with each other. Second, with rapid aging and diminished prospects for growth, all sections of the population need to cooperate for society to progress. Third, Increasingly, as people live longer, 
the aging policies which have a long lead time Thank you, Dr. must Asher. begin I'd early. I'd like to stop you there as your time is up. And back to the proposition, Professor Gupta. Your one minute begins now. The question is about progress in Asia. It's not about the old versus the young. Our continent is largely young and also largely poor. For example, in South Asia alone, which is home to the largest number of the world's poor, over half a billion people live on less than a dollar a day. The average Indian is only 29 years old. Two-thirds of Indians are below the age of 35. So the choices are unfortunate but inevitable. Do we choose between people who have more yesterdays than tomorrows, or do we choose those who have more tomorrows than yesterdays? It's an unfortunate but inevitable choice, and the answer is very clear, that we must invest in the future, which means we must invest and prioritize our scarce resources for the young to provide them education and jobs. As Brutus said at the funeral of Julius Caesar, it's not that I loved Caesar less, but I love Rome more. Therefore, ageism you, is a Gupta. necessary evil. I do evil. have to stop you right Thank there. you. Thank you. And now to the opposition, Ms. K. Your one minute begins now. The progress of any society requires attention to all groups of people in the society. Indeed, the foundation of society must be inclusive, must be cohesive, and must be equitable, and must include the most vulnerable, such as older persons. Older women are particularly burdened and excluded because it, in many countries in this region, as they have faced cumulative discrimination throughout their life course. Therefore, to even suggest that a group of persons should be subject to ageism, to stereotyping and prejudice, and to be treated differently with negative impact simply because of their age can never become necessary for the progress of society. Thank you, Ms. K. Asia's demography has changed rapidly. Declining fertility rates and rising life expectancy means an increase in the sheer size of the continent's elderly population. By 2050, China is projected to have 100 million in the oldest old category, followed by India with 47 million. So is the silver lining really a grey cloud on the horizon? Will this demographic change necessitate a reallocation of resources? Now, throughout the course of this debate, you, the studio audience, can post questions to our panelists. We'll be taking some of those questions later during question time. A poll is also ongoing. You can vote for which side presents the more convincing argument. We'll be tracking this poll throughout the course of this show. Up next is your stand. Each panelist is given three minutes to argue and expand on their points. The proposition began just now, so let's have the opposition start. So, Dr. Asher, if you're ready, your three minutes begins now. Thank you. Let me expand on the argument that demographic factors are significant but not of overwhelming importance. In developing Asia, between 1980 and 2010, 0.95% of growth per year could be explained by demographic factors. From 2011 to 2013, 30, next 20 years, minus 0.2% per year of growth is going to be projected to be due to demographic factors. So we need to keep in mind that there are other growth strategies and other growth requirements that the countries will have to follow, and the knowledge economy is one such factor. Second area is that the institutional retirement age in Asia has been sticky and is low compared to the uh, aging of the population. In many countries, the life expectancy at age 60 will be between 20 and 25 years. Uh, so now, if the retirement age is early, how do you use their accumulated uh, skills and wisdom uh, in order to support the economic growth process while bringing them into an active 
an integral part of the economic and social life of the country. The opposition mentioned about the, about the younger South Asian population. By 2050 in India alone, there will be 330 million people who will be above 60 years of age. Now, to have 330 million people to be left out and or to be felt discriminated against through ageism policy is not going to lead to social harmony. If they perceive, if the elderly perceive themselves to be discriminated, they could organize politically and create the kind of situations which would be uh, counterproductive to the harmony and the progress of the, of, of the society. Finally, aging policies require a long lead time. That means we have to start young in order to get the policies uh, projected and instituted in a proper way. So artificial division in terms of young and old is no longer a viable policy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Asher. And now over to the proposition. So, Dr. Omkar, your three minutes begins now. You see, Asia is young. And East Asia, you know, when you look at East Asia, it's economic miracle, 25 to 40 percent of that economic miracle is attributed to demographic dividend. Now the rest of Asia is in that position where East Asia was. In, in, by 2000, Japan, they got out of it. Why not the rest of Asia reap the same kind of harvest that comes out of the demographic dividend? Mind you, this is one-time opportunity. It, once it's gone, it's gone forever. So we must seize that demographic dividend opportunity now while it lasts. You see, because if we don't have resource, prob uh, resource constraint problem, we can afford everybody, but we have resource problem. Therefore, demographic dividend harvesting requires that our young population be trained, be, be equipped with good education, good knowledge, good health. Now, my opponent says that, you know, that when you look at the number of the popul population in the young age, below the age of 60, in the working age, 90% of the Asia is under that. Therefore, we, we, giving that 900 some figures, figure-wise, the number of young in Asia is overwhelming. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now, but to, to, to derive that demographic dividend benefits, these young population, if they are not well equipped, what happened to East Asia, Latin America will happen to us. Latin America and East Asia were in the same situation in the, in, in, during the 70s until 2007, but Latin America stayed behind. East Asia went forward because they took the advantage of dividend, demographic dividend by training the young people with good education, good health, and technology innovations because tomorrow's Asia is going to be future, complex future. Too many diff difficult problems, no more past growth model is not going to help future. So therefore, enabling the young uh, will have to be not resource-based, but innovation-based, but uh, 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 productivity-based, or else Asia could be uh, stuck with that, what is called middle income uh, status, uh, the quagmire, MIC. So the resources, therefore, the wisdom lies in, therefore, Devote, uh, allocating our resources to the young so that we can, Asia can progress and realize the century, the Asian century. The stakes are high. The one-time demographic dividend opportunity is right in front of us. And this is not the time for emotions. It is the time for logic and rational. This is a defining moment. Asia's progress, we, uh, young progress, young Asia progress will be Asia's progress. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amkar. So we've heard from the first speaker from the proposition and the opposition. Audience members, you can post your questions to the panelists. You can also take part in the poll online. Let's have a look at the poll as it stands right now. 22.2% now agree with the motion and 77.8% disagree. Now, if you remember, uh, the first figures were 28.6% and 71.4% again. So there has been some movement, but it still appears that most of the audience disagrees with the motion. 
After the break, we'll continue with your stand. So please stay with us. You're watching Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. The motion tonight is, Ageism is a necessary evil for progress in Asia. Before the break, the first speaker each from the proposition and opposition made their arguments. Now, the next speaker from the opposition will have three minutes to state her case. So, Ms. K, your three minutes begins now. My teammate has clearly shown that ageism cannot be necessary nor justified because of demographic or economic issues. I will continue the argument, but from a different perspective, and that the progress of society must benefit all and must be built upon a foundation of, that is inclusive, that is cohesive. And this would require treating all groups of people without stereotyping, without prejudice, and without unreasonable or disproportionate impact of which this will be aging and age discrimination. In fact, discrimination, ladies and gentlemen, is a very slippery slope. Who decides on the criteria for discrimination and on what grounds? Today, we may be discriminating against the, old, the, the older persons, but what about tomorrow? It could be the disabled, it could be the poor, it could be the young unmarried singles. So indeed, we, are, we should not go down this, this, dangerous, sleepy, this dangerous slope. To make matters worse, how can we just justify ageism when it leads to elder abuse and violence, which is already prevalent in many countries in this region? And added to that, as I said earlier, there's a cumulative discrimination which is against women, which is already prevalent in the region again. Indeed, the countries in this region are beginning to realize that an aging population must be addressed and can be addressed. And we have done many measures, like in a recent survey done by the United Nations, it shows that almost all the countries in this region are taking some measures. For example, they have set up coordinating mechanisms at the national level. They have set up, they have uh, uh, established uh, um, uh, national plans and policies. They have revised discriminatory laws. And very importantly, taken measures to improve economic security, in, even in many of our developing countries. Measures for social protection, for increasing employability and in re revising retirement age, and also uh, measures like equity release. Our countries have also revised uh, taking reforming the health systems so that we are looking on, folk, on, on disease prevention as part of a life course approach and providing ac uh, affordable health care and active aging. And also providing an enabling environment such as a uh, aging in place, having building livable uh, communities and age-friendly cities. Indeed, the key is longevity planning and progressive implementation, even if resources are constrained, and definitely not resorting to discriminatory ageism and age discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. K. And now over to the proposition. Professor Gupta, your three minutes begins now. Let's not get carried away. Let's think with our heads, not with our hearts. Let's not get carried away by the bogeymen of discrimination that our opponents are talking about. Let's focus on the proposition. What is a necessary evil for Asia's progress? It's not that we are against the young or the old. We are all agreed that we are for Asia's progress, for lifting millions and billions of Asians out of poverty, who are also young at the same time. So it's a question of prioritization. It's a question of allocating a scarce resources where they are most needed. The number of young Asians entering the labor market is vastly greater than the number of Asians who are aging. So it's a necessary evil. It's a hard but unpleasant choice that we need to make. So therefore, I appeal to my opponents, please think with your heads, not with your hearts. It's not about discriminating against the old. It's about favoring the young, because that is the future of our continent. I disagree with the fact that the demographic dividend is insignificant. Studies conducted by IMF economists by Modi and Iyer show 
that in a country like India, the big difference between the states that have grown fast, such as Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, and the states that have not grown as fast in past, such as Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, is entirely, largely due to the demographic dividends. The data is here. The point remains that 350 million South Asians will enter the labor force in the next 20 years. We need to create 1.2 million jobs every month in South Asia for the next 20 years. So it's a question of prioritizing our resources. And when it comes to looking after the aged, the young are the best insurance. We should not follow the bankrupted models of the West, of pensions and of Medicare or Medicaid. In our culture, in our value system, it's the young that look after the old. So there is no contradiction between favoring the young with providing them with scarce resources to get good jobs, good education, so that they in turn can look after the aged and not follow the atomistic, individualistic and the bankrupted ideologies of the West where the old are left to fend for themselves. So if you really believe in progress in Asia, if you want Asia to rise out of poverty, then please agree with the proposition that this is a necessary evil, this is an unpleasant but necessary choice. As I already said, as Brutus said, it's not that we loved Caesar less, but that we love Rome more. So the point remains that we must accept ageism as a necessary evil for progress in Asia and for el eliminating poverty in our continent. Thank you, Professor Gupta. The argument is prioritizing resources versus marginalizing the old. The panelists have indeed provided much food for thought. Before we get to the questions posed by our studio audience, let's have a look at how the poll stands right now. 47.6% agree with the motion, whereas 52.4% disagree. So there has been quite a significant shift in favor of the proposition. They are chipping away at the initial lead of the opposition. We're now going into question time. We'll be taking some questions from our studio audience. I believe a gentleman in the first row has a question. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Tanir Malay. I'm from the SPJ School for Global Management. Thank you. And um, my question is for the proposition. Um, it is, wouldn't an inclusive society be ideal? So can we redefine progress to include people of all ages? You see, the question of, you know, when, when, the, when, the, when the waves, when the tide rises, everybody benefits. When Asia progresses, we are not saying that only the young will benefit, the old will be cared, left uncared, ignored. Old, the old days also will be benefiting. The question here is really, we have limited resources. How do you want to allocate that resources? Because Asia could, the 21st century could be the Asian century. BRICS says that, ADB study says that, but that calls for focusing on what is, what is with us, the young population. The priorities, because you, when you help young, you are helping the old. You are, when you enable the young, you are enabling them to be so much more supportive to the old. It's not the question of old against age. It's not. Let's look at how demographic dividend can be realized. Demographic dividend means that there is a rising share of the working age population in total population. The resources that are devoted today to education, healthcare, other social services, to infrastructure, these in terms of GDP of various Asian countries are fairly reasonable. Uh, in some countries, expenditure, government expenditure to GDP ratio is approaching 30%. Now, way to help the young is better public financial management, not ageism. In many countries, because in the past, insufficient investment was made in high-level manpower, today to get the same young people to be educated, we have to get the elderly. The Silver Brigade is the one 
that is increasingly helping these societies. Now, if the perception comes about that they are discriminated against, that's not going to be healthy, and it's going to work against the arguments which you are, which you are making. In the age of social media, perceptions are extremely important. So any recourse to ageism is something that needs to be avoided. I can see there's a question for the proposition. This is an online question. If older workers are filtered out through policy, do you think we will have a better society? We can have high growth, but end up on a lower welfare curve. This is for the proposition. I don't think so. I don't agree at all. The question is not that we will have a lower welfare curve, because as I already said, the best old age insurance is not a pension fund. Pension funds, you've seen what's happened in the West. People's life savings are bankrupted by ill-invested uh, pension funds. The best old age insurance in our cultures, in our countries, are the young who will look after the old. So this is a false dichotomy. The idea is that we have to make hard choices. If we could have inclusive growth, that would be great. If we could have a world without war, we would not need police or, or the armies. The question is that life is about hard choices. And the choice that we are being asked to make is not between the young and the old. The choice that we are being asked to make today is do you want Asia to progress or do you want Asia to be where Europe is today? We do not want Asia to repeat the mistakes of Europe or the United States, where the budget is bankrupted by entitlements largely to the elderly and Medicare and Medicaid. We want Asia to progress, we want Asia to eliminate poverty, and we want Asia to put its future before its past. Professor Gupta has made a very convincing case, but perhaps um, he's a little bit behind the curve when it comes to sociological factors. Because um, it is true that uh, from our figures that we can see, the family size is decreasing in almost every part of Asia. And so therefore, to have the children as an insurance for old age is, if I may say so, a little bit outdated concept. It's a cultural uh, concept. Yeah. It's a cultural I, I, but, concept. But, but, but in, in terms of real physical, in terms of real reality, we are, cannot think in terms of a 3G family all living under the same happy household. So there have to be alternatives. There has to be, for example, uh, older people are productive. Many of them are still working. I'm sorry, Thelma. My father doesn't live with yeah. me, but I look after him. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of whether you live with your parents or not. It's a question that in our culture, we have a culture of looking after our aged. And we cannot have laws and legislations replace what's in our culture of looking after our aged. And so therefore, I think that we cannot just depend on the fiscal uh, contributions to, for the state to provide education to the young. I make sacrifices for my children's education. And that is a very Asian virtue. And for, therefore, we are thinking of these bankrupt ways of thinking about the world which are existing in the West, which do not apply to our continent. No, but I think we are looking at a very realistic view of a diminishing family size, of diminishing family households. And therefore, we have to look at the older person who is aging as being, okay, to be more productive, to be more self-sufficient, and to really look at alternative avenues of economic security and health security. There are countries where this, uh, you know, non-working aged people are increasingly getting bigger, but the Asia that we are talking about, except East Asia, where that group that you are mentioning hasn't come yet. If we don't, if we don't harvest the demographic dividend which comes our way, this is a one-time opportunity. You need to make, bring them up so that the opportunities available are uh, properly uh, you know, uh, ex uh, exploited. And not just that, like my colleague said, you know that 25 million of young people every year is entering the Chinese labor force market. 16 million in India. In the interest of and with respect to the old age, of course we always love them, we admire them, we are always, they are always, on, you know, we, we, we carry them. But those 16 million just in India, 25 million just in China, and imagine the rest of Asia, labor market, every year these young people are entering the market, 
And the least we could do is to engage them. And the more we could do is to engage them in a more productive world. I'd just like to interrupt for a second and draw your attention to the polls very quickly. We are neck and neck. 50% of the audience agrees with the motion and 50% does not. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but don't go away. Bridging Asia, the Singapore debates will continue in just a short while. Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. The motion tonight, ageism is a necessary evil for progress in Asia. This is question time where our audience is posing questions to our panelists. We have a question on the online system, which is for the opposition. The question is, if your son and father are both critically ill today and your resources can only save one, who would you allocate those resources to? Question for the opposition. This is a kind of particular question where there is a need to ensure that society has got the mechanisms and institutions where we can find resources which are going to be allocated fairly and equitably. That does not mean we don't have to make some difficult choices at some point in time. Those decisions are not based on the matter of the how many years remaining or the economic value of life, but they are based on ethical decisions and ethical choices. This kind of a question cannot be answered in an a priori way without looking at the particular circumstances. I would attempt an answer to that. <laughs> I, I would have a very easy way of answering this question. My father and my son. I would simply go to my father and ask him this question. And I challenge you to find any grandfather who would say, favor me over my grandson. I pray to God that we are not faced with this dilemma, but unfortunately we are. Life is about hard choices. And these countries do not have enough resources to achieve everything. If we could, we would. Let's, let's look at so the priority is that we look after the young and we depend on our value systems so that the young then look after the old and we do not go after these Western models of Professor pension Asha. funds, etc. Let's look at the uh, amount of or the proportion of GDP that's being devoted to the old today in many Asian countries. The range is between 2 to 4 percent, 5 percent at the most. It's going to go to around 10, 12 percent as age-related expenditures increase. Now, if you are going to reallocate resources, 4 to 5 percent that is being spent today the most that can be reallocated is 1% of GDP. You are not going to solve the kind of issues, the demographic dividend, with 1%, even 2% of GDP. That's not the reallocation mechanism that's going to solve it. The demographic problem is going to be solved by sustaining growth through use of knowledge economy and knowledge management instruments. For that, the ageism is not a relevant issue. Thank you. We have a question that many people in the audience have voted for, and this is uh, direct to Dr. Professor Gupta. And you spoke about uh, asking your father's opinion on the hypothetical situation. How about asking your son? Could I have a quick response, please, from Professor Gupta? <laughs> I, I, I don't have one, unfortunately, so I can't ask the hypothetical son that question, but yes, the question is certainly that uh, there is a sense of sacrifice at both ends. But the question also is, as it happens in the West, look at how much of your fraction of your entire medical expenditure you spend in the last few years of your life. If I had all that money, if I were a millionaire and I could spend millions of dollars on protecting myself and getting a few extra years of life, that's fine. But if you have to make that choice, 
We are not talking about an ideal world where we can look after both. We are talking about choices and you look at the data, you look at food battles that are fought within households. Parents sacrifice for their children and so do grandparents. Thank you, so Professor the question Gupta. is that we need for the future of Asia to invest in our youth. And as Mukul mentioned about the expenditures of GDP, well, you know, GDP numbers, you can make whatever you want of them. But the fact is that it is entirely clear that education in our country is underfunded. And education all over South Asia is underfunded. And we need the jobs and we need the education. I think, um, you know, we keep talking about older persons as yesterday has been, you know, like, like, like uh, they, they are really outdated dinosaurs. But actually, we are living in a real world where today's older persons is a new breed of older persons. They are people who are better educated and are going to be in better health. And I really, I, I'm really not part of the, the group that you can say, well, you know, uh, let's, 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 let's. Precisely for that idea. reason, may I, if I may interrupt my worthy opponent, precisely for that reason, they do not need the crutch of the state. They have the embodied capital, they have the education. So if the state has to put its money, it should not be putting more money into the elderly, but it should be putting into training the young man who does not have the PhD, who does not have the education. So you've exactly proved my point. No, no, but the, I don't the, think the, the talking, older, the older person is already a crutch. mature person. If I may finish, about, yeah. the older person is the mature person. He already has the education. She has the, the, the experience, the wisdom. Do you think that person is more willing, uh, deserving of support or that 15-year-old unemployed youth who needs a better future and a break? Again, let's have a look at the polls right now. 45.7% agree with the motion, 54.3% disagree. So it has swung slightly in favor of the opposition. Let's, ask, let's look at a very particular public policy problem. In almost all Asian countries, civil servants and military have got a very generous, often non-contributory pension for life, which is indexed to prices and wages, which is already a constitutional requirement, statutory requirement that, has, that is spoke, spoken for for the future tax earnings. Are you guys suggesting that political economy will allow those pension promises to be taken away? Yes or no? Certainly not, but that's an excellent example. You have exactly proved my point that these unfunded pension li liabilities are the, exactly the wrong kinds of policies. And since we both come from a school of public policy, let's agree that such unfunded liabilities, for example, the government of India, now in future, we do not make these mistakes. Just because we have had these kinds of mistakes in past doesn't mean that we should be trapped into repeating this. And you have exactly made this, uh, my point that these are exactly the kinds of short-sighted policies that we must not be repeating in future. But these are there. So if you want to reallocate in a real political economy sense the resources, you will have to take those benefits away. Not necessarily. Now, I, we do not simply need to perpetuate those, uh, uh, those, those wrong policies. So therefore, now when, when people enter the labor force in the government, we do not need to have lifelong pension for them because we can have contributory provident funds and you are obviously an expert on that area. But the point remains exactly that when it comes to public policy, that those are exactly, that is exactly ageism, ladies and, uh, the, the adultism, ladies and gentlemen, that I was talking about. That you are giving people a lifelong pension. That is exactly adultism and that is exactly what we are opposing. Thank you for that. There is a question from someone in the front row, I believe. Willie Chang from Council for 30H. Since Professor Gupta is personalizing this, right, I want to ask him whether um, old age is something that we all are, uh, we all would eventually get to if we, um, if we don't die of an accident beforehand. And when you get there, are you going to be um, happy that uh, society has discriminated against you, even when, in your view, you are able to uh, contribute very fully? to the progress of society because somebody up there has decided to make some hard choices which discriminates against you. If I may summarize, uh, the proposition is being asked, will you stand by yes. your yes. position when you are subject yes. to first, ageism? First, let me say looks are deceptive. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when President Bill Clinton reached the age of 50, he said what I said, he said, I now have more yesterdays than tomorrows.
and by that definition, I'm in that same group. And the fact remains that it is not a question about uh, ageism being good. Remember the proposition, it is a necessary evil. Sometimes we have to accept unpleasant things just because we want to work for the larger good. So nobody defends any kind of discrimination, whether it is adultism or ageism or communalism or fundamentalism or any such bad kind of ism. The question that the proposition is placing before us is, is it a necessary evil for progress in Asia? And as the member in the audience just mentioned, that it seems unfortunately to us, given the limited resources that our continent has, barring a few minorities of a few countries, if you look at the vast numbers of Asia, look at the half a billion people in Asia, South Asia living below a dollar a day. You have a double-edged sword. You have to look after their interests. And also because if you fail to do it, the whole social fabric can be rent asunder by social unrest of these unemployed youth. So it is not a question of what I believe in my heart, it's a question of what my mind tells me. Thank you very much. Our panelists have taken quite a number of questions from our studio audience. There are many, many more as well. There are many questions which we didn't get to because uh, we are running short of time. But here's a look at some of those questions which we did not have a chance to get to. But have our panelists managed to shift the sentiment on the ground? Here's a last word from our panelists. They're still coming up later. But before that, let's take a look at the poll. And 48.7% agree and 513 disagree with the motion. So stay tuned to Bridging Asia, the Singapore debates. Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. Tonight's motion, ageism is a necessary evil for progress in Asia. We are now entering the endgame after a fascinating war of words. It's time now for the final word. I would request each speaker to sum up in one minute what his or her final thoughts are. We're starting this round with the proposition. So, Dr. Amka, if you're ready, yes. your one minute begins now. We have seen that this, this debate is really about the competitiveness versus fairness. We've got to learn from other countries' experience. East Asia clearly shows that this there is a demographic dividend can be reaped in uh, promoting your growth, or else if Asia does not stay competitive, the world does not owe us living, as Lee Kuan Yew in his book says. Uh, One-time opportunity here, we must grab it. Let's grab it, because other continents are not keeping quiet. And we have to perform, or indeed outperform them. Now, these are long-term, multi-generational issues. Good policies are necessary, but that alone will not be enough. This will call for a very visionary leadership that can withstand the heat of the present pressure. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Dr. Amka. Over now to the opposition, Dr. Asher. Your one minute starts now. This is an unprecedented time in global history when we are facing rapid aging of the population. There is a lot of anxiety. There is no disagreement that demographic dividend must be tapped. The question is how. Almost all the reports that come out on uh, addressing aging, there are two common recommendations. One is to link retirement age with increase in life expectancy and to support longer working lives or at least generating a proportion of income from work during the retirement period. So the idea is that the elderly must be an integral part of the solution and should not be regarded as a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Asher. And now, Professor Gupta, your one minute starts now. Let us not think as Indians or Chinese 
or the Japanese, Singaporeans, let's just think as Asians for a change. Let's not just think of ourselves as young and old, let's just think of us as Asians. And let us just think as Asians, if we want Asian century to be realized, as my colleague mentioned, what is it that we need to do? What is it that we need to prioritize? And what are the hard choices we need to make, unpleasant as they may be? And the answer is inevitable, that we need to prioritize and put money and resources into hundreds of millions of Asia's youth who deserve a voice, who don't have a voice at the table, in whose name decisions are being taken by the elite. So I think if we think as Asians, if we think of what is necessary evil for promoting growth in Asia, then the answer is inevitable, that we must prioritize Thank you, Professor the youth. Gupta. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And Ms. K, your one minute starts now. Since I have the last word, I think ageism, the, uh, the growing, a growing older population should not be seen as a peril or big severe problem because it is an issue that can be addressed and it is an issue that our governments are beginning to address. We have some way to go that is true, but we know the path and the path does not lie in discrimination, does not lie in ageism, but lies in working together, in cooperating, in longevity planning, and in working together with the young and the old for intergenerational solidarity. Thank you, Ms. Kay. You've heard from all our panelists. They've had their say, now you have yours. Cast your votes now. Choose if you agree or disagree with the motion. The votes are in and the audience has decided. Now at the start of this debate, 28.6% of our audience members polled for the motion, 71.4% had polled against. Let's take a look now at the final tally. Have our panelists been able to sway our studio audience? 41.3% have polled for the motion and 58.7% have polled against. So I must congratulate the proposition for winning some votes, but it is the opposition who has won this round. Congratulations to Dr. Mukul Asha and Ms. Thelma Kay. You have convinced the audience that ageism is not a necessary evil for progress in Asia. Dr. Omkar Shreshta and Professor Srikant Gupta, thank you for being part of Bridging Asia. The Singapore debates, you have managed to garner quite a number of uh, votes for your side, and you have acquitted yourselves very well. In the next 50 years, the number of people in Asia aged 65 and above will increase by several fold. With this unprecedented pace of population aging, Asian governments must tackle important policy challenges. Taking care of our elderly has always been a much emphasized Asian value. But will directing resources to the old undermine Asia's burgeoning economic growth? A tenuous balance and definitely one of Asia's greatest challenges in the 21st century. Let me thank all our distinguished panelists, our studio audience and also our viewers for taking part in this debate. Find out more about the debates and make your stand on today's motion by visiting our website, channelnewsasia.com slash bridgingasia. Thank you and good night.